know, but I thought we'd kind of talk at the end of the day about the habit of Twitter. So before I start, how many people in this room have a Twitter habit? Okay. Keep your hands up if you have such a Twitter habit, you'll probably be on it during my whole talk. Okay, <laughs> so it's still a few of you. Um, you know, and so what's pretty amazing of Twitter is like, I know, it's, it's something that I think is one of the most sort of habit-forming technologies we've been kind of talking about all day here. And it's got this really interesting characteristic, which is, you know, when I joined the company in, in 2009, um, this is what the website looked like. And most people that I talked to or met thought I was crazy for going to Twitter. And I was leaving Facebook, which Julie just did a great job talking about how important Facebook's been in the world. And I asked most people if they use Twitter, and they would say, no, maybe I check it sometimes. Or they would say, oh, I tried it. I didn't get it. So we had this really interesting problem in the world where there, people were talking about Twitter all the time in the media and saying, oh, Twitter's this great new thing. You should be trying out Twitter. But people were not kind of adopting it as a daily habit in their lives, except for a very select few. And, and so one of the things as we kind of go through the talks, I'll talk about the message of Twitter and what it said back in 2009. It said, Twitter is a service for friends and family and coworkers to communicate and stay connected through the exchange of quick, frequent answers to one simple question. What are you doing? And so if you were to really read this and kind of take it to heart, to have the Twitter habit means you're constantly going on Twitter, telling what you're doing, and exchanging you know, quick things with friends, family, and coworkers. Which if you really think about that description, that's a lot like what Facebook's always been like. And so as we kind of go through this exercise, and I'll talk a little about how we really built Twitter as I think a mainstream habit for the rest of the world, um, I'll talk a little bit about, about how we made this shift, both thinking about as a company, making changes to our product, and making changes for kind of how the whole world thought about Twitter. So the first thing I'd like to say is, back in 2009 again, um, raise your hand if you remember when Twitter was on Oprah, and it, you know, she made her first tweet, and it was a really big deal. And, and there was this really interesting effect happening with Twitter. The people in the media, the people who blogged, the people who were, were actually in the press were actually they love talking. They love talking in the world. They love talking in the media. They love talking on blogs. And so they all love Twitter because Twitter was this great new outlet to talk in the in-between times. So if you were a blogger, you might want to write like a really long piece and react to other people's stuff, but then you'd find Twitter and be able to talk to exactly those same bloggers and go back and forth really, really quickly. And so what was neat was that they talk about Twitter on their blogs or in the media. So if you're like most of us consumers, you're reading media, you're reading blogs, you're watching TV, all you hear about is Twitter, 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 because these people were doing it. So they had this habit, this habit of quick, simple exchanges of information. But the fundamental problem with Twitter at the time was that wasn't what most people wanted. So we had this really interesting problem when I joined the company in the fall of 2009, which is everybody, you know, Ev basically said to me, he's like, hey, welcome to Twitter. Here's a problem I want you to work on. Everybody signs up, but we need a lot more of them to stick around to really end up having a big business. And, and so, so we really thought about like, how are we gonna figure out what is this problem with Twitter? The media loves it, the media talks about it. People who love talking, love talking on Twitter, but we need to make it a habit for everybody else. And the people who we ask, we're like, do you use Twitter? They're like, no, I don't use Twitter at all, but I check it sometimes. We're like, but that is using Twitter. You're checking it, you're, you're paying attention to what's going on. And so we need to create this really big shift to understand it. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of the exercise that we did to try to understand um, our users and what we were really building for. So the first thing we did is we actually did a, a, we asked ourselves. We did a really introspective exercise to say, what is Twitter about? Who is Twitter for? What is this habit that people should have? The habit's clearly not shouting out into the world and, and talking with everybody else because most people don't seem to want to do that. And so we started doing a brainstorm and I'll show you just some of the stuff from the board. We said, hey, is Twitter for someone who tweets? Maybe the whole point of Twitter is if you want to tweet, we have this great new product that lets you do that. But we've already talked about that that didn't make sense. That's not the habit, the, the daily habit, the many times a day habit of using Twitter. So then we said, well, maybe it's for someone who wants to stay up to date with friends. If you remember that homepage, that was kind of our, our core message of what we thought Twitter was about. But if you think about this, is it for someone who wants to stay up to date with friends? Again, that's Facebook. Facebook's really where you're, you're already doing that. And we weren't gonna create this new habit to use Twitter to stay up to date with friends. So then someone in the room said, maybe it's about somebody who cares about real-time news, because what's Twitter best at, real-time news? 
And if you guys think about that, that's actually pretty good. Like a lot of people in the room were nodding along, like, yes, we're all about real-time news. And so, you know, then we started asking friends and family outside the company, do you care about real-time news? And most people kind of don't. And if you, <laughs> you know, if you, ask it, if, if you ask it that way, most people are like, real-time news, news, it's on at five o'clock, I read the newspaper. It just, it just wasn't something that people were like, that's what I want. I've always wanted to have this habit of getting real-time news. So if you ask the media what it was, they were like, all Twitter's for is for someone who wants to know what their friends had for breakfast. That's clearly why you'd use Twitter. You're either a creepy person who just wants to stalk all your friends and have breakfast, or you're not gonna be using Twitter. Or even worse, you're one of those real weirdos who wants to tell everybody what they had for breakfast. You just wanna log in every day and say, look at what I'm eating for breakfast. It's funny enough, like Instagram's kind of become that with these like great food pictures. But um, it, it, as we really thought about it, like. What's Twitter for? And so, so finally, kind of through this whole discussion, we, we, we came to this conclusion. We said, Twitter fundamentally is for somebody who wants to know what's happening in their world and who really cares about this sort of what's going on in their world. And we define their world really, really importantly. It's not just your friends and family. It might be the favorite sports teams, celebrities you really like. If you're into technology, following some of the greatest news about technology. If you care about the weather, it's getting the weather reports delivered to you. But we really wanted Twitter to be the place where if you wanna know what's going on in your world, you would go to Twitter. And so then if you come back to this kind of idea of habits, we wanted to create the habit that, that many times a day you wanna know what's happening in your world, you're gonna to turn to Twitter to do that. And if we can get you into that habit of checking Twitter to find out what's happening in your world, we think we'd have a really important sort of fundamental property that would add meaning to you know, hundreds of millions, billions of people's lives. And so that's what we started naming the product for. I mean, so that was asking ourselves and getting to this conclusion that's like, that's what we wanna do. But it's still only as good to say what you wanna do until you actually listen to your users and, and do some other work. So, so the next thing we did was a, a really great exercise on user research. And this happened right around the time I was joining uh, the company in partnership with a firm called Adaptive Path. And, and we went through and said, okay, how can we understand what value our users are getting out of Twitter and does that map to what we think is important? And so we, did, we found a very interesting group of users. And, and by the way, I highly recommend talking to users. We talk so much in the growth world about data, 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 but until you actually have those one-on-one -on -one anecdotal conversations, you can never really get to the heart of a, a lot of your issues. And so we picked a select group of users. These were people who had signed up for Twitter, then not really done anything and gone dormant. So they were gone for over 30 days. And then at some point in the second month, became active and found Twitter and started using it every day, every couple days. So he said, there's something really interesting about this exact characteristic. Something had attracted them to Twitter they were interested enough to sign up. Something had they, gone totally wrong where they signed up and then decided it wasn't worth their time or energy. And then somehow a month or two later, something else triggered them to come back and start to have a really meaningful experience with Twitter. And we, we uncovered two great things. The, the majority of people who said they signed up for Twitter the first time, they said, well, I heard about it in the media. People were telling me it was all about tweeting and I could go and get an audience. You know, I was talking to somebody who uses it all the time and they were like, you gotta go on Twitter and get followers. And so we kept hearing this story about, you know, I just heard about it in the media or I heard that I should go use it to get an audience. So then they'd, they'd, they'd tell us, and then I signed up and I had no idea what to do. I ended up following some random people and it, like, I didn't know what to say, so I might have like, written a tweet and then I left. And then we said, okay, so what happened next? Why'd you come back? And in every single case, we heard something like the following. I was at my church and my reverend talked about how he's tweeting you know, biblical verses and statements every day and if you wanna stay up to date on his sermons or his thoughts, you should be following him on Twitter. Or I went to this restaurant and they said they're gonna tweet out the daily specials at 11 o'clock every day and I could figure out if I wanted to go there for lunch. Or I heard about this food truck and they tweet out their location. So in every case it was, I heard about, or somebody would say like, you know, I heard my sports star was just tweeting all kinds of funny you know, background stuff, like Shaquille O'Neal was on Twitter, um, he was very popular at the time. And so I heard that he was on Twitter and it was like really funny and so I wanted to go follow him. So in every single case when the person came back, it was because they heard about following something interesting and following something that mattered to them. And so we thought, well, they did not get that at all the first time. They didn't really even think that Twitter was for that. So how can we fix that? So that's kind of our, our big learning from talking to our users. 
And the last thing we did was dug into our data. We said, look, at this point in the company, it was, it was you know, mid to late 2009, we've already had you know, tens of millions of people at that point try to sign up for Twitter. And many of them had, a you know, few of them had a great experience. Most of them didn't come back. As I said, when I joined the company, one in four people came back in the second month. So we were losing 75% of the people who were even willing to come and sign up for the product. But of the people who did stick, we said some people get it. They're having value in their lives. They're having meaning. Some are sticking because they're tweeting a lot, but maybe some are sticking for other reasons. So we did what I call as kind of this like core user chart where we try to figure out who's sticky and who's not. And this basically is a, 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 just a quick chart that showed if you come back n times in one month, what's the percent likelihood you come back that same or more times in the second month? And for Twitter, we figured out that the number was around seven, which means if you came back at least seven times in one month, which is about twice a week, you're over 90% likely to come back seven times in the second month, the third month, et cetera. So that meant you were pretty sticky. So, so we said, okay, some people get it, those people, we'll call them core users because they now are coming back over 90% likelihood they're gonna come back that many times every single month. And then we did a, a big statistical analysis of a bunch of different factors, including how much they tweet, how many times they direct message, what they followed, who they followed. And we found two specific signals out of all of that research that were significant. The first was the people who were sticky versus everybody else followed at least 30 accounts. And so that meant that they had somehow, it was not easy to follow at the time on Twitter, found their way to 30 accounts that interested them. The second thing we found was, um, talks about kind of following and following back. So if you think about Facebook, Facebook's 100% bi-directional. Every single person you friend, friends you. It's, it's always mutually approved. LinkedIn is the same way. But Twitter was kind of the first, you know, back to 2009, kind of big asymmetric network. And yet you could either follow somebody or you could also follow them and have them follow you back. And we found that for these people who were stickiest, it was this, what I call the two-thirds, one-third ratio, where about one-third of the people you followed followed you back, meant that you actually had some people you knew on the system, but a lot of people like sports stars and you know, tech writers and you know, other celebrities or, or bots that you were just following, or brands that you were following that weren't following you back. So you had a really healthy mix of stuff you were interested in and some people that you knew. So, we took all this data, we took our theory of what the habit of Twitter should be, we took our user research that told us people care about following and understand following and that's the habit they wanna have and that's the one that got them sticky even though Twitter didn't help them get there and we took our data that says if we get you following more people and get you having a few mutual followers, we can give you a great experience and we said, given this, how can we change Twitter and change the perception of Twitter so that we'll get everyone to have this habit? How can we supercharge this thing so instead of having 10 million users a month, we have 100 million users a month, and really 100 million users a day? Because we felt like Twitter should be that important in the world, and this is back in 2009. So now I'll talk a little bit about the ways I think, the, how we made these changes and, and how we really thought about it. And the first one I like to talk about is called Inception. And, and we really had to change the perception. If you've heard a lot of the stories I've already told about Twitter, people just had the wrong impression of Twitter from the very beginning. They thought about Twitter as this place where you tweet, where you broadcast, where you tell people what you're having for breakfast. And if you have nothing to say, Twitter's not for you. We even had all these people who said, I don't use Twitter, I just check it. Like, that's using Twitter. So, so we changed the homepage. Um, and, and it turns out, most people don't read, but actually everybody reads a little bit, and they kind of, as I, I say, they get incepted with the idea of what you're about from the words they read, even if they don't read carefully. So if you remember that first homepage that talked about Find out what your friends are doing through exchanging quick, simple messages. That incepts you for like, you need to be talking a lot on this platform or it's not useful. I mean, if you use SMS and you never SMS anybody, SMS is actually not a useful platform. But Twitter's not like SMS. So we changed the wording to say something more like, find out what's happening right now with the people and organizations you care about. And, we, and, and just the moment you check out Twitter, even if you leave the homepage, never come back, you now know a little bit more about what Twitter's about and you're incepted with the idea that we cared about. The second thing we really worked on was PR. And so, if, again, one of the big great benefits of Twitter was that the press loved talking about Twitter, but they always talked about it in their terms and not necessarily in ours, and not necessarily in the terms that would be great for most mainstream users. 
So this is a story about Conan O'Brien. I'm not sure how many people remember this anymore, but when he got fired from NBC, he went on tour. And he literally tweeted like once or twice and sold out the entire tour in an afternoon. So the press articles would come out and say, Conan O'Brien, with one tweet, he sold out an entire tour. And for most people who would read that message, they're like, okay, like why should I use Twitter? That doesn't help me understand it. But we started to reframe the story. We said, if you were on Twitter from 2 to 5 p.m. on Thursday, you might have had a chance to buy tickets to Conan O'Brien's tour before it sold out. And so the moment we shift the story, instead of telling you that you should tweet because you'll sell out something, we tell you you should be on Twitter checking it all the time so you don't miss out on something really important like something you care about, like a tour from Conan O'Brien. And that fear of missing out is really one of those key factors that drives you to like always be on Twitter. It's funny that somebody just asked Julie about Oculus Rift, and the only reason I found out about it is because I always feel like I'll miss out on the latest news if I'm not checking Twitter all the time, which is how I found about it this afternoon. So, so I think that fear of missing out and getting people incepted with the idea that if I'm not checking Twitter a lot, if I'm not this habit of using Twitter all the time in my life, I'm, a, I'm not gonna be in the know on everything. We can talk about inception and how it applies to advertising, how it applies to SEO, how it applies to viral invites, but it's really this core concept that every single time somebody hears about your product, if you wanna start forming the habit, it starts from that moment. That first moment they hear about what you're doing, it's gotta connect with what you really want them to be doing over time, and then every single step along the way that gets them there. So inception is step one, step two is adoption. You have this moment now where people have heard about your product, and they're actually motivated to come to your site. It's kind of an amazing moment. It's, it's actually this thing that we, we all take for granted, but like someone actually downloaded your app or came to your website or visited your business. And for whatever reason, most companies that I see try to rush you through this process as fast as possible. They're like, we don't want to get in the way of you using our product. I hate to say it, most products that we build are actually pretty hard to use. I mean, if you really hand somebody a Facebook news feed just like full out, like it takes a little while to get into the habit of using it and getting good information. It's the same thing with Twitter. It's the same thing with, with almost everything. When you first get your iPhone, you don't know how to do all the capabilities. It takes time to build through every single part of what the experience can do. So what I always say for adoption or onboarding somebody, it's your moment to take as much time as you possibly can from this user to train them on what's important in your product. Because if you can get them to understand what habits they should have over time and to go step by step by step, you may end up getting them hooked. And if you just rush them through it, the likelihood you'll get them hooked um, is much, much worse. So coming back to Twitter, this is what you saw when I joined the company to sign up for Twitter. There was a big search box, which by the way, if you've ever searched on Twitter, it's not the most useful thing. And if you don't really know what Twitter is, it's really, really hard to get value out of that. But, but they might click the green sign up now button because they were so motivated by seeing it on Oprah, seeing it in the press, hearing about it from Conan O'Brien, that they would go through it. And then the next thing we did is we said, awesome, go find your friends. So if you go back to this, I've talked about how Twitter's not about your friends. It's about information, it's about your world. But now we're teaching you it's all about your friends again. So, so again, it's a little bit confusing. And then the next thing we do is we're like, here's 20 random people, go follow them, awesome. And you have no idea who they are, why they're selected, what they're about. And then if you click, most people, by the way, skip both these steps because they didn't know what to do and they were pretty confused. And so they'd end up with something like this, which is terrible. Um, <laughs> and you know, I like to call this the white screen of death. Um, and if you get here, this means that you now have no concept of Twitter. You might have had some idea incepted in your head, but nothing has helped you get the habit. Now, if you actually did just click yes, 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 you might end up with something like this, which is a very, very busy thing with a big box at the top that says what's happening. And again, you still don't really know what to do. You haven't manually followed anything. You haven't trained yourself on anything other than if I click through a couple screens, I end up with a very busy screen. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of what the, new, the Twitter flow looks like today. And, and this, this flow was a bunch of work from the time I joined the company until this launched in 2011. This is kind of the best flow we got it to. 
And, and since I and a bunch of people who worked on this have left the company, they've tried to beat it many times, and they still haven't yet, although we, we, we think they will at some point. But this is kind of the canonical flow, and I'll walk through how it really trains people on that habit that's Twitter. So the first screen is nothing. It says, welcome to Twitter. There's a Twitter teacher who's telling you that this is a tweet. Tweets have 140 characters and sometimes links. And you think, oh my gosh, like this is gonna be this horrible process where it's just gonna like walk me through every single feature. But what we're really trying to do is like slow down, pause, take a breath before you go through the flow. We're still trying to be cute and say, get started in less than 60 seconds to give you the impression that it's fast. Trust me, like most people who really end up using Twitter down the line don't get through this in 60 seconds. But, but we're trying to give you the motivation to go through, but say, really, just pause. And by the way, putting this screen in, we tested, we get more good users kind of a week later with a screen like this in than not. Then the next step tries to teach you following. So it basically says, hey, just here's some random people. Go click on them and follow them. And every single time you click, their tweet shows up on the right. And we're trying to train you in that habit. If you click follow, you get tweets. Follow leads to tweets. It's a pretty good habit to have if you really want to use Twitter over time. And so we, we just teach you this. And these are based on some pretty algorithmic suggestions. They're popular people. Hopefully you'll find something. We nudge you along if you're trying to hit next before you follow at least five, just to kind of train you in that habit. And again, we're just training you in the following habit. We're still not really walking you through what Twitter's about. And then we get to the magic screen where we start telling you, here's what Twitter's about. Now don't just follow random people that we're suggesting, but follow by these categories. There's music on Twitter, there's news on Twitter, there's sports on Twitter, there's entertainment on Twitter, there's fashion on Twitter, there's politics on Twitter. If you're in France, you see French popular accounts suggested. If you're in Spain, you see Spanish popular accounts suggested. We really try to make sure that you start to understand these are the things you want to be following. The habit you want to get into is checking what these people have to say as often as possible. And if you follow them, you will get tweets. So you can see how it's building up now on the right. And then the last step, we finally go back and say, okay, now go find your friends because we think friends are important too. And I think the whole point of what I try to say is friends are important on Twitter. It's just not the first most important thing. We don't want you to, to be inceptive with the idea that Twitter's just about friends. It's about all these other things and friends. And so the adoption flow or the onboarding flow really helps you get there. And then the final step is we try to get you to set up your own profile because we want to say, you will want to have a voice here that matters on Twitter, add a picture, add your bio, and you'll have, it, you'll have your own presence. But we try to make this last to show you that it's much less important than the habit of following or, um, or, or even finding friends. And so when you finally go through Twitter, you end up on a screen like this. And this looks very, very different than the screen I showed you before. You've carefully made a bunch of suggestions. You've clicked follow many, many times. And you're now seeing this is Twitter. All those things you clicked follow on are showing up here on the right-hand side. And by the way, here's suggestions to follow more. There's now a tiny little box that says, if you want to tweet, go tweet. And so we really shifted the entire adoption flow based on all that stuff we learned before about what the habit should be, why we wanted people to have that habit, how, what our data told us about how to get more people into that habit, and we re-architected the entire product around those theories. And it worked. Over these couple of years, Twitter grew from about 10 million active users to over 100 million active users. Retention went from one person who signs up to, to over four. Sorry, one person out of four who signs up even comes back the second month to much closer to one in two. Um, and, and this really, this shift started working where most people in this room hopefully adopted Twitter and got the Twitter habit. And the Twitter habit isn't tweeting, it's checking Twitter. And, and I like to show, this is a chart that, that we used kind of in the early days of Twitter that was really, really helpful for us just to understand how we were engaging our audience and how we were converting new users. We just basically bucketed, I, I call this the kite chart, but we basically bucketed how many users who signed up ended up in our core bucket, which is that used it over seven times a month, how many ended up in casual, which is in the second month, they used it one to six times, how many ended up in the cold bucket, which meant they stopped coming back, and how many transitioned from the other buckets on a monthly basis. And by understanding this flow, we had a much better sense of how many users we were getting to core, and core users are really what drive the business over time. So hopefully, you know, you'll realize that building these habits, building these kind of daily behaviors that we want to check constantly and really be in the know and understand what's going on, like, 
partially it's a great product that starts at its core and just really, really works. But to get it to be mainstream and to get to reach hundreds of millions of people it takes a lot of careful thought and analysis. But not just look at our data and try to build what the data says, but this combination of introspection, talking to our users and really hearing from them what was working and data in order to get there. So I hope that was a, a good use of the end of your day because I think there's drinks now afterwards. So thank you guys very much. So it sounds like we have time for a couple questions. Um, Okay, so the question was, on the last one I showed kind of this diagram of users by time. Really, this was just conversion from month one to month two. So new users and where they ended up and how they flowed on a monthly basis. And he asks, do we just look at data that way or did we have personas as well? Um, you know, I think it, on Twitter we found, we basically decided the, the core behavior was people who came back at least seven times in the month and really designed for that level of data. Over time, as the companies kind of evolve much further, they've really figured out there's a bunch of different personas in the company. There's people who tweet a lot, there's people who use direct messaging a lot, there's are, are very conversational with that replies, there's people who are mostly listeners who never tweet. And so over time, it's evolved much more deeply to understand these various different personas and how sticky people get there. But you know, it, you know, back then, we could only do so much. So that's where we started. Sure, right here. Yeah, that's a great question. She says, all the slides I showed were like the web, which feels really old, considering we're now in this mobile era and nobody uses the web anymore. Um, <laughs> sorry, that, was, that wasn't totally what you said. Um, yeah, so, so look, I, you know, I had this, this luxury of this, this period, this, you know, this really period was 2009 to 2011, which was truly the explosion of mobile, but it was still just beginning to mainstream. I think, you know, what I like to think about is that the core principles of most of what we learn on Twitter are actually very, very similar to, um, you know, whether it's on the web or mobile or whether before it was desktop software. It's understanding your user what they're going for. I think in, in mobility, you know, you have some really neat benefits, which is like accessing the address books much, much easier. So people have figured out that doing friend finding on mobile is much easier using the contacts graph than it ever was before. I think there's some things that are also better that you actually end up with an app often on the user's phone that makes it easier to use push notifications to sort of re-engage them in different ways. I think you lose some of the flexibility of testing and rapid iteration that we were able to do on the web. But in general, I think all the same core principles apply and I don't think it's a wholly different way of thinking for mobile. That's just the era. I think Twitter and Pinterest are kind of two of the last companies that we'll see having gotten really big on the web. And I think you know, most of the companies, whether it's Snapchat, WhatsApp, et cetera, that we're starting to see, you know, in Uber, you know, all of the things they're gonna do are really about mobility and about working within mobile apps. But I think the fundamental principles stay really the same. Hi, thanks. Um, so you mentioned that in the Sorry. beginning you had tons of people signing up and they ended up like blindly subscribing to a lot of, or, or um, basically following a lot of people that they didn't care about. And then you changed the onboarding process to be more efficient. But what happened to all those people that had kind of the incorrect setup accounts? Like how did you re-engage them and get them to uh, you know, have a cleaner feed? Look, I'll be totally honest. I think most of them were just gone. And I think a lot of them came back and signed up with new accounts or they would, they would clear out their account. I mean, once somebody signs up for your product and doesn't come back in 30 days or 60 days, the, the next time they show up, they're pretty much starting from scratch again. And so we found a ton of people would sign up with new email addresses. They'd complain, they'd say, yeah, my email address is taken, I wanna sign up. And so we'd unlock, you know, support would sort of unlock their old email address. Or they'd remember their password, come back in, and kind of go through some of the new engagement flows. But I think the, the reality is, Twitter just has this swath of, of accounts with people who followed exactly 20 people from the sort of default select all that are gone. And you really need to think about how do I get the next user and the next user, and when they come back after that period of time, think of them as somebody new again. Cool, so I think that was our last question, but I'll stick around a little bit afterwards as well.